you know, you talked about poison and rock. You really came from more of that world in the earlier days. I mean, I remember you talk about going back memory lane. I remember meeting you at a NAM, not NARM, a NAM convention, National Association of oh, Music Chicago. Merchandisers, where you were playing sax in a booth. <laughs> and I walked up to you and I said, oh, man, you're Richard Elliott. And you were like, well, yeah, I think so. And um, I said, I remember you from Kitty Hawk. And you were like, wow, you, you listen? Uh, yeah, of course. I was like, they were kind of a this very cool jazz fusion unit yeah. that um, – that was, that was some of your earlier days, wasn't it, in recording? It was. And that was in Chicago, I think, where we met, right? I think so. Chicago, Nam McCormick. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I remember that. Um, yeah, Kitty Hawk was one of the first uh, recording groups that I, I uh, was lucky enough to be a part of. I graduated from high school in 1979, uh, 78, actually. Uh, went to Cal State Northridge uh, and um, started getting opportunities to do studio work and and kind of sub and fill in with different bands. And um, it just kind of worked out. It's amazing. I feel very, again, let me preface by saying I've been very, very lucky. Uh, I grew up in Los Angeles. I was born in Scotland. I grew up in Los Angeles, which you know, between LA and New York, I think you're talking about more incredible musicians per square inch than anywhere in the world. And so I just feel extremely lucky that I was in the right place at the right time and got the right breaks. Um, I mean, I've worked hard, but uh, I think, again, I think timing uh, has a lot to do with it. But anyways, um, I was going to college and I was kind of playing in cover bands and doing things around town, going to jam sessions around LA, trying to get known. And um, I got a call from this uh, fellow who was uh, who was in a group called Kitty Hawk, and they played this instrument called the Chapman Stick, which mm -hmm. was ten stringed touchboard. Uh, so it was like a, a stringed instrument, like a guitar or a bass. It had uh, like five bass strings and five lead strings, and it was an amazing is an amazing instrument. And yeah. this band had two stick players in it. So it was very unusual. And uh, yeah, I got a call and uh, would I be interested in coming down and meeting the guys? I went down, met with them, and uh, we recorded two records for EMI America. And um, uh, it, it, that just kind of got things started for me, got the ball rolling. And that was in 19, that was in 79. And wow. I think we record, I was 19 years old. And I think we recorded our first record in 1980. Um, so yeah, that was the first thing, but you know, it's interesting. I took whatever I could get in terms of, you know, playing situations. If someone called me, it didn't matter to me if it was a jazz gig or if it was kind of a more of a fusion type thing, or if it was rock and roll, I just wanted to play. So, mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm glad, uh, looking back on that because I mean, I have very eclectic tastes in terms of the music I listen to. I listen to all kinds of music. Uh, equally so I played any kind of music I was up for doing. I mean, I'd go play, you know, I'd go play, uh, you know, an Armenian wedding and, uh, <laughs> you know, or do, I mean, really pretty much anything and that I could get my hands on. And then, uh, right around that time, I also, um, I met, uh, well, actually the way this is funny, how you talk about things, timing and, and, uh, and being lucky. Um, there was a fellow, a saxophone player that was playing uh, a lot for two producers at Hitsville West in Los Angeles. And Hitsville West was the West Coast recording studio for Motown Records. Mm. And these two producers, uh, Steve Berry and Tony Peluso, were producing a lot of Motown's artists at the time. And um, their regular sax player wasn't available. And this is how it works. Someone said, well, I know a guy who maybe can sub for, for your regular guy, why don't you give him a call? And I got the call and I went and played. I think the first thing I did for them was uh, on a Smokey Robinson record, uh, just wow. the back solo on a, on a Smokey song. And um, we hit it off. We got along and they seemed to like what I, I did. And then from that point, they started calling me. And so this is kind of how it's been in terms of uh, the type of music I've played over the years has been pretty eclectic, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. 
Well, so so the um, so that was that the kind of connection with I remember you um, like the four tops and temptations and, and it was that all from that connection? Yeah, that was all from that connection. That was from from Steve Steve uh, uh, Barry and Tony Peluso. Yeah, and then it was shortly after, the, and I was also going on the road a lot too. So I had done, you know, I played with on the road with a, a, a few different people. I, I went and did a European tour with Ricky Lee Jones. And, um, uh, and how was it to work with Rick? How was it to work with Ricky Lee? She's brilliant. She's yeah. just a brilliant musician, a brilliant artist. Um, I was, uh, and it was thrills and spills. I mean, she was very demanding in terms of. The oh way yeah. She wanted things done. Um, but that was good for me because I was young. I was, again, I was what, 21, 22 years old at that point. You know, I was still, I had a lot to learn. I still have a lot to learn, but I really had a lot to learn back then. And wow. uh, it, so I just took it as a, it was all of just a big learning experience in terms of learning about my craft and how to do it as well as I could do it. But at the same time, also learning how to be a team player how to be a support musician um, mm -hmm. in, in a, in, you know, in a backup role, which is pretty much what I was doing most of the time. I, you know, I, I didn't really have a solo career at that point. And so, you know, playing with people like Ricky was great. And then uh, I, after that, I went on the road with Melissa Manchester. That was a completely different type of musical sensibility. Again, she was an amazing artist and she had Things, she liked things a certain way, and it was another opportunity for me to learn another facet of uh, of being a musician and yeah. and and so and being in a support role. And, I, I've had the opportunity to work with with both uh, Melissa. She performed at at the Jazz Is Clubs a couple times, and uh, a wonderful lady, uh, uh, Ricky Lee Jones. It, my experience with her is actually uh, a great story, and that is. Um, as you remember back in the day when you were on the cover of jazz is we, we would do our own photo sessions. We bring in wardrobe makeup and we, we try to be very, very professional and, and make the covers look more like lifestyle magazines than jazz magazine. And um, so we got to Ricky, uh, her photo session and um, they started asking her to pose a certain way. And she literally looked at the photographer. She said, let me make one thing clear. I'm here. I'm going to do things. You shoot the camera as much as you want. Don't ask me to do anything. If you catch what you like, that's great. But just don't ask me to do anything. <laughs> I was like, okay. Okay, that really kind of sums it up. 